Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We, uh, we knew that Alan would, uh, would call the troops. <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody. Um, Alan would draw troops. Just a quick little bit about Hildine. Uh, those of you who have been here the last, last two parts of this series have heard me say this before, but let me just quickly recap. Um, Hildine's mission is values into action. Um, sort of straight from Lincoln, but now made our own. Um, core values, integrity, perseverance, and civic responsibility. Civic responsibility in some ways is that which from everything that happens it will be in flows. Um, um, and today's, per if you have the core values, and it's values and active, the core values, then we have the key actions. The key actions that he'll be in are historic preservation, which makes perfect sense, I think, land conservation, um, one of the ways I think people don't always think about Hildine is one of the great land conservation program, programs in southern Vermont with our 412 acres and some of the most beautifully and diverse, beautiful and diverse landscape uh, around. Um, civil civic discourse, again, straight from Lincoln, the notion of civil civic discourse and sustainability. Today's program, the third of the series, relates to at least two of those, land conservation and sustainability. Um, we had Dave Curtis come a month ago, actually, uh, and talk about <laughs> the geologic history of the Earth, bringing it all down then to the Battenkill Valley in 40 minutes. That was quite an achievement. <laughs> um, and that, that was fabulous. And uh, last week, uh, we had Steve Ravel, um, one of the prominent, most prominent hydrogeologists in the state of Vermont, talk about water. Today, Alan's going to talk about trees. And next week, um, our own. Andrea Lucchini is going to talk about soil. So it's rock, water, trees, soil. Um, to really complete the notion of everything that makes up what is this valley in which we live. Um, <clears throat> so what's happening at Hildeen? And this is consistent with this series. What we're really doing at Hildeen is bringing our entire 412 acres to life. Um, it you know, started off being about the, the house and the house museum, but still is in many ways but now it's about bringing the entire 412 acres fully to life. Um, we have, as you know, the, the gardens, both formal and less formal. Um, the goat dairy, Pullman car. Our trail system is one of the gems at Hildeen that we work very hard to maintain well. We have 12 miles of trails, and we encourage people to really come and take advantage of those trails. They're gorgeous. Um, now it's about returning the Dean, or what was commonly thought of as the, referred to as the meadows, um, to life. Returning the Dean to agriculture, where we'll, we'll over time, some of this is already, a lot of this is already in place. Animals, the greenhouse, which is now fully up and running, the teaching greenhouse, and the concomitant high school program that's up and running it down on the a Dean as well. Pollinator pathways, and of course, the floating boardwalk in the wetlands. Um, <clears throat> membership allows access 360 days a year. Um, and uh, for, for no charge, so one buy your membership, you can come every day of the year if you want to. In fact, we hope you do. Um, we have some materials in the back on that back radiator. Let's sort of talk a little bit about where Hildeen is going. Feel free to pick one up on your way out so that you can uh, have a better sense of where we're going. Um, by the way, at the end of this, before I forget to say this, I think everybody filled in a little piece of paper on their way in um, with your name and email address. Um, and we'll, be a, we'll do a drawing at the end. Um, and the person who is, whose name is drawn from the hat, of course, Lincoln's hat, will receive, receive a copy of Reading the Forest and Landscape. What a, a fabulous book. Um, so, um, every week, and I want to make sure I do this uh, very specifically, we want to thank GMAT, um, Greater Morshire Access Television, not just for fil coming and filming this today, but for everything they do for the community. They are at events like this all the time, um, different, different times, different places, and making programs like this available to the wider audience they serve. And it really is a remarkable um, remarkable service, and we should all remember how important that uh, is to our community. Um, now, Alan Calfee is president of Calfee Woodland Management. He has an undergraduate degree in natural resources management from the University of Maryland and a master's in forestry from the University of Vermont. Um, through his business, he, along with his compatriot Mike, Mike White, helped hundreds of private, municipal, corporate, and non-profit organizations, including Hildeen, 
manage their properties in a holistic, sustainable, long-term approach. I think that's one of the keys, is long -term, sustainable, long-term approach. Um, I'm going to leave out a lot of Alan's credentials. They are extensive and they're impressive. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more personally about him. Um, he, Alan has a passion uh, for observing, studying, and understanding the whole forest. He's constantly learning, and he enjoys sharing that which he learns with others, as he's consistent with today. Um, he's involved in land conservation efforts locally and statewide. He also personally practices what he preaches, as he and his family were selected as the Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year in 2014 for their stewardship and outreach activities on their woodlands in Rupert. He's the real deal. Um, Alan has been Hildeen's forester for more than 10 years, at least 10 years. Um, he listens closely to us. He helps us develop goals and ultimately a 25-year uh, management plan, forest management plan. But consistent with that notion of constantly learning, teaching, and interacting with us and our property, it is and it isn't a 25-year management plan because we are constantly reviewing, constantly rethinking, constantly tweaking the plan um, to keep it up to date with all we consistently, with all we constantly learn on a global, local, and very small scale basis. There's really, in a way, there's no, there's, it's never set in stone, constant rethinking, um, constant <coughs> learning, and constantly shaping. Just by way of example, we have moved our plan from the top goal being sort of a little bit vaguely about wildlife um, to a more precise goal of managing for songbirds and other pollinators. Um, that thinking has intersected with the way we garden, the way we take care of our lawns, the way we do everything at Hilton. Um, our woodlands are not isolated from our other 200 acres, something that Alan and Andrea and all of us constantly think about and piece together in a way that makes the holistic, the whole 412 acres operate in a consistent, sound way with a long-term goal of um, sustainability. Pollinators are at the top of our property-wide focus on sustainability. Um, this is Alan Caffey. Uh, this is why he's our forester, uh, why we consider him really a member of Hildeen's staff, and why we have him here today. So, thank you, Alan. Thank you all for coming out. I'm very pleased that it's kind of a drab, dreary day out because I wouldn't want to drag people in to talk about forests inside when it was a beautiful April day. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to dive right in. I'm going to go through uh, my slides and I just ask you to hold questions till the end. We'll have plenty of time at the end to discuss, but I have uh, quite a lot of information here I'm going to toss out at you and we'll, we'll go right through it. So. We're talking about looking at the, the forested landscape here in the Battenkill Valley, and people often think of, well, both trees and actually forests as sort of inanimate objects. Because in our puny little lifetimes, they seem to change very little. Um, but if you zoom out in space and in time, uh, you can really see that there is, forests are an incredibly dynamic thing. They're always changing. And I like to say that forests really are more of a process than a thing. Um, and I can only kind of skip across the surface in my talk this morning, but uh, understand that this is an amazingly complex ecosystem. We're learning more and more as our technology for observing the natural world gets better. We're learning more and more about the incredible interconnectedness of all the pieces in a forest. Uh, and I, I like to say that, that forestry is not rocket science, it's actually more complicated. Uh, <laughs> and for any rocket scientists in the room, I apologize, but uh, there's just so much we don't know. There's so much we, we still don't understand about all these interrelationships between fungi and plants and uh, the climate and all the animals and all the different pieces. But I'm gonna try to look at a few elements that do uh, characterize the forest around us here, and then tell a little bit of a story about how our forests have developed and, and uh, come to be what they are. Uh, and if, if we have time, we'll, we'll ponder the future uh, slightly. So let's start with the trees themselves. Uh, there's this term, silvix, uh, 
And Silvix refers basically to how a tree grows. You might think of it as like the personality of a tree. And I listed some of the elements here. It's shade, to it's tolerance to shade, it's early relative height growth, site requirements, all these different things that make each different tree species, and of course this has evolved over a matter of millions of years, but makes each different tree species capable of competing in a particular place. And it's the combined, all these combined personalities of the trees that have uh, the forest develop uh, as we see them today. A couple quick examples. Um, this is an aspen tree, trembling aspen. Uh, people call it the tree that loves to be hated. Uh, you'll see it growing out of a crack in asphalt. It can grow on practically nothing. Here it is in a bunch of shale. Um, it has very light windblown seed that travels long distances. It has very fast uh, relative height growth early, but it's not very long lived. Uh, it root suckers, so it produces other trees, clonal trees actually, off of root suckers. So if it's in the forest and there's some kind of a disturbance, it can rapidly take advantage of that growing space and take over. So trembling aspen on one, one end of the spectrum, we call these pioneer species because they're often the very first trees to come in after some type of a disturbance. Anybody know what that is? Oak. Oak. Quercus rubra, my favorite tree in the forest, uh, red oak. Uh, kind of on the opposite end, uh, we could argue a little bit about it, but kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from aspen. These are teeny little seedlings, this is a hard hat, in the forest floor. Uh, as part of my master's research, actually, I aged some of these seedlings, and some of these seedlings could be up to 20 years old. Very, very, very slow growing can grow under almost full shade in a canopy, so very tolerant to shade, um, but grow for a long time. Probably in our forests, some of the longest living hardwood trees. Uh, we've found trees in Vermont that are over 300 years old. Um, so again, shade tolerant, uh, very heavy seeds, right? The seeds don't travel far, acorns, unless they're assisted by blue jays or squirrels or other things, which they are. Um, but so the, those are kind of the two ends of the silvical scale. And there are trees, of course, all the way in between. Uh, but just to present that these trees have developed ways to compete in very particular environments. And that is what produces the forest that we have. Another factor that's important to consider is what foresters call site. And this is where the tree grows. Um, this particular diagram is the best I could kind of find to encompass everything. So you have the aspect, you know, the direction that the land faces where the tree is growing, which gives it a certain amount of relative light. You have the soil conditions on that site. You have bedrock, which feeds into that. You have uh, precipitation, uh, climate, all these things that affect where the tree grows and what trees are capable of going there. This is complete tangent, but it's just interesting on this uh, diagram. This is from Hubbard Brook, which is an experimental watershed in New Hampshire. Of 100% of precipitation, they actually measure, they have weirs on these streams and they measure the amount of water that falls and the amount that runs out of the streams. Stream, 60% of the water that precipitates on this land comes out as streams and 40% comes out as evapotranspiration. So we hear a lot about how forests are very important for uh, carbon cycle, yes, but also water, and it's this filtration and uptake and uh, evaporation uh, process that's very important as a part of that. So site is where the tree grows, um, and that also dictates what trees can grow in certain places. This is from a book by Tom McAvoy, who used to be the extension forester. Uh, and we talk in sight about how elevation and topogra topography are somewhat proxies for climate. If you go to the tippy top of Mount Mansfield, you'll find actually an alpine tundra ecosystem very similar to what you would find in northern Quebec or in Labrador. And as you move down the slope, you find trees that are you know, adapted to uh, more 
warmer climates. And you see that here, right? You go to the top of Equinox, you find spruce fir like you'd find in the Northeast Kingdom. But also the site sometimes, you know, the aspect, like I said, there's a downslope movement of nutrients on a mountain. So sometimes the toe of the slope is highly enriched with nutrients that have moved down and you find a much richer ecosystem at the base of the mountain. So a little bit about site. How do these forests change? You know, as a question again, so I'm, 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 you have to believe me if I tell you they're not static, that they're, they're always changing. And even before humans were, were dramatically impacting the system, the forests were changing. So question, not including human impacts, what is the predominant factor that has governed changes in the forest over the last 10,000 years? Climate. 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 Weather. Weather. Fire, not fire. Who said windstorms? Windstorms. Um, a forest ecologist, Charlie Cogbill, uh, in northern Vermont, says that every acre of Vermont's forest will be affected by a major wind event at least once every 100 years. Um, and this is something, again, we don't really see. Um, very, very much unless this happens to you. Um, this is three or four years ago in West Paulette, a uh, summer thunderstorm, straight line wind. It, it was more than a microburst. This, this person's woodlot, 84 acres, their entire woodlot looked like this. Oh my God. Um, speeds, uh, wind speeds around uh, 80 miles an hour. Uh, but fairly localized event, but bigger than a microburst. Um, hurricanes, um, and I don't like to talk about this because the, the thing is we're overdue now actually given the, the cycles of hurricanes. This slide just shows some of the major hurricanes that have affected Vermont over time. Uh, the last big one was 1938. Dramatic, dramatic effect on the landscape. Um, some people say it blew over 60% of the forests in Vermont. And actually, interestingly enough, is how uh, consulting foresters uh, got started in Vermont because there was all this timber lying on the ground and it all had to get uh, scaled and moved and that was when the, the first private consulting forester showed up was to help with these hurricanes. This was a derecho, which is a, a bigger scale event that actually moved across the Adirondacks. This picture was taken at Merck Forest, uh, 65 acres or more blown over. Trees were snapped off in the middle, which indicates wind speeds over 100 miles an hour. Um, this is my brother standing next to a, a root mound. And you'll see this, the indications of these events when you go out and walk in the woods. There are these little uh, humps and, and, and valleys, you'll see um, wind throw mounds. And if you take, so we're looking at the tree, this is the end of the tree and the tree's going that way. And if you decay all this down, the wood disappears. You're left with a little mound where the root was and where that whole wad came up, a little dip. And you can see these places and they actually last a long time. Uh, Interestingly enough, when we were working on the management plan in this particular stand, it was filled with these wind throw mounds. And there was a note in the plan that said, this area might be susceptible to high winds. <laughs> we were right. But um, there are a bunch of different disturbances and they range in scale and frequency. Um, glaciers are a big disturbance. Uh, and so, but they're very infrequent but very dramatic in the effect, all the way down to branch abrasion. In a, in a, after a winter storm, you look out across the snow in your yard and you see little pieces of branches sitting on top of the snow. Well, that's created little gaps in the canopy that come the growing season now, there's more light that's able to penetrate the canopy, get to the forest floor, and you'll actually get plants taking advantage of that light. So a whole, whole realm of different disturbance, and that's, that's what drives the forest, uh, the changes in the forest. Uh, 
And basically, in, in good forestry, what we're trying to do is mimic some of these events uh, in, a, in a kind of a man-made way. What is siltation? Siltation is just when you have flooding and you have soil eroded, and then the, that soil is deposited elsewhere on the landscape. Ice storms, we had a big ice storm in 98, I think it was, and everybody was like, this is unprecedented. We've never had an ice storm like this before, but it had just happened, you know, 30 years before, and nobody really could remember it. But <laughs> these, these are very dramatic. Some of them, like 98, cover large parts of the landscape. Uh, two years ago, in November, we had a smaller scale event that just affected pockets. And it breaks crowns apart, and again, creates more growing space for trees to grow. Uh, porous tent caterpillars, anybody remember those? 2005, 2006, they're on a 17 year cycle. This is a, uh, a natural uh, insect that grows, you know, is, grows actually everywhere in North America and is on this cycle. Incredible effect in the forest. Three years of intensive defoliation and the response in the understory was amazing. I mean, raspberries and other uh, brush and, and herbaceous plants, but also re regenerating trees that were allowed to get established just in that brief window where there was some opening in the canopy. This was our hero, remember, that brought down the forest tent caterpillar with the uh, friendly flies that actually lay their eggs in the, in the caterpillar, and it was what ultimately took that, naturally takes that population down. All right, so let me start with my story. Let's go back, I don't know, 500 million years. And for those of you that were here for Dave Curtis's talk, some of it's redundant, but I, I can't tell my story without, I don't know, I would pass this around, but can anybody see a pattern in that? So that's a maclerite, a uh, sea snail. And that snail uh, died and, was deposited on a shallow, the floor of a shallow lagoon uh, 500 million years ago, somewhere close to the equator. Guess where I found that rock? In Vermont. In Vermont. <laughs> Tom? Uh, Button Bay, in, uh, up in Panton, uh, near Virgins, Vermont. And um, so the bedrock that we have around these parts, which you all may be familiar with, uh, marble. You can marble at it, just don't take it for granted. <laughs> uh, so marble is metamorphosed limestone. And the limestone came from uh, this shallow, uh, shallow sea that was actually huge in expanse. Uh, that was filled with these uh, carbon-loving creatures like this maclerite and corals and other things like that, and deposited this incredible layer of calcium carbonate, which solidified into first limestone, and then over a period of a million years, uh, I think they say a mile and a half deep or something under these mountains, was pressed and, and uh, under pressure and, and a little bit of heat and compressed into uh, the, what we found around here today, this formation of marble. This is the Gettysburg Quarry in, uh, in Dorset around uh, 1900. Uh, this is the proprietor, Mr. Prince, uh, early on. So, why is this important to force? Why do we need to talk about marble and limestone and calcium? Soil. So back to our site thing. One, th one important factor for what's created the incredibly rich and diverse forest that we have here in the Batten Kill Valley is that we have this limestone based or marble based bedrock. Um, and uh, calcium is a, obviously a very important nutrient for plant growth. But the limestone also acts as a buffer. Uh, and has been a great advantage to us through the periods of high acid rain uh, in the 60s and 70s, and it's still going on today. If you go to the Adirondacks uh, or even into the Green Mountains, those forests have suffered much more dramatically 
from acid rain uh, because of the lack of this buffering capacity. The Battenkill Valley really divides the Green Mountains, which are very acidic soils, granitic-based bedrock, from the Taconic Mountains, which have this limestone uh, marble feature uh, producing just incredibly uh, productive soils. And you see it in the, the abundance of tree species. And we have basswood and two kinds of hickories and sugar maple that grows beautifully here, yellow birch, red oak. Um, you know, you shift over into the Green Mountains, it's large, you know, more hemlock, more red maple. Um, and so very, very important feature that affects that site, site component uh, we talked about. I don't want to get off on a marble tangent, but this is a picture of the Gettysburg Quarry, um, maybe a little later than the previous picture. And I don't really have a, something to compare it to, but if you were driving down Route 30, this now is all woodlands. Uh, and in this picture, you can kind of see it's a terrible picture, but how open this is and how open it was uh, further up the valley, and, and we'll get to that piece. All right, so I only have 45 minutes. We better keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go 10 to 30,000 years ago. Anybody know what was going on in that period? If you were here, glaciers. If you were here for Dave Curtis's. I love Gary Larson, so. Say, thag, wall of ice closer today. <laughs> so um, you want to talk about disturbance, right? The glacial epochs were a major disturbance on this landscape. Um, this is a, a, a graphic you see often uh, today in discussions around global climate change. These are uh, ice corings from the Vostok ice sheet. Uh, that actually they can look at uh, temperature levels and CO2 concentrations going back 650,000 years before present time. This one goes back about 400. Um, and you can just see down here in this lower bar, it indicates the minimum temperatures that were uh, obviously causing these continental glacial epochs. Um, so three of them in the last 300 thousand years. We really usually only talk about the most recent one, certainly when we're talking about vegetation. But this was uh, up to a mile thick sheet of ice that covered uh, the Northeast, certainly covered the entire part of Vermont. The very peaks of Mount Mansfield and Camel's Hump probably were exposed, but everything else was covered with ice. Uh, the weight of the ice was so significant that it actually pressed the surface of the earth down 100 feet, and that is actually still to this day uh, rebounding. But all of the organic matter, all of the vegetation, everything was scraped like with a huge bulldozer off the surface of, of, the, of New England. Um, Cape Cod is the terminal moraine. That was the limit of the glacier that sort of dumped the big pile of debris, uh, which is Cape Cod. And this just shows the extent of the ice as it moved over time. But for us, uh, and when we talk about forests, obviously this was extremely important because it removed all the soil and all the organic matter. So uh, we took everything back basically to gravel and rocks and dirt. If you've been to places that have been glaciated, you know, in Alaska or whatever you can imagine. It also, as it scraped everything off, it was smearing this, uh, what we call glacial till across the landscape. And that was the substrate that was to become the soils that we have today, um, but very gravelly, sandy, uh, not very much uh, nutrients. The Champlain Valley, the productive agricultural lands we have in Vermont, the Meadowy Valley, these were glacial lakes uh, as the glaciers were retreated that deposited these, you know, up to six foot thick layers of uh, beautiful silt that became very productive agriculturally uh, as soil. So the soil that we have today, one inch of topsoil, it's taken 10,000 years mm -hmm. to develop that. Mm -hmm. um, I won't steal Andrea's thunder, but 
it just points to how important it is, uh, how important our soil is, and how important it is to protect that, because it takes a long time, obviously, to develop it. But from a forest perspective, that set everything back to zero. So um, there's a process then, as the glacier retreated, and there were some clima clima climatic things. Obviously, it was colder here as the glaciers were retreating. But there had to be some sort of a progression that brought plants and trees back to the landscape, right? So remember our friend the aspen. Light, wind-blown seed, grow in the crack of an asphalt, uh, asphalt parking lot. And probably first uh, lichens, uh, small plants, and things that could grow in nutrient-deprived environments. Slowly they'd rot, start to create just a little bit of organic matter where uh, another plant could get a foothold. Uh, this is a process uh, or a model uh, that's used in, uh, in forestry, it's called succession. And it's, many, uh, uh, many ecologists would argue that it's much too linear and we could spend the rest of the day debating it, that's not what we're here for. It, it is linear, but it is a model that describes how vegetation overtakes uh, a site. In the case of a glacier, we call it primary succession because there was nothing there before, but you start with a very disturbed site, clear-cut fire, whatever. First you get herbaceous vegetation, then blackberries and such. The pioneer hardwoods, aspen, pin cherry, paper birch, you know, and it, it keeps moving into this progression until you have some trees established. Then uh, as that red oak has been slowly creeping northward after the glaciers retreated, definitely being helped by squirrels and blue jays and things that carry acorns. But then they can establish themselves under the canopy of, say, paper birch and aspen uh, and get a foothold. Probably the biggest uh, controversial aspect of this slide would be this uh, concept of a climax or steady state forest. Um, and as I've showed sort of with the disturbance regimes that we have here, that doesn't really uh, happen. Other places, uh, Pacific Northwest, that it's under more of a fire regimen, doesn't have the wind uh, effect. You get trees that are 2,500 years old. You know, get forests that are that old. But here it's constantly getting set back or, or circled around in the middle here, uh, that type of thing. All right. <laughs> um, so, what happened 350 years ago, approximately, plus or minus? There were definitely people here. Uh, and, and in my career, I've learned a lot more. Of, you know, we, we have learned a lot more about the people uh, that were here. And there were a lot more people than we actually think. There, some estimates say there were. Uh, 75 to 80,000 uh, Native American peoples that lived in the area that we now call New Hampshire and Vermont. I mean, it's a, a lot of people. And they definitely interacted with the forest. They did use fire and, um, and other things. But uh, largely, there was, uh, we call it the pre-settlement forest. It was a largely undisturbed, uh, except by natural disturbance, continuous forest. Uh, these are from some dioramas that are down at the Harvard Forest in, in Petersham, Mass. It's, and it's, it's really, the pictures do not do them justice at all. They're beautiful and it's, it's well worth a trip. But here you have the pre-settlement forest with large hemlock trees. Hemlock is another long-lived, uh, slow-growing trees. Uh, beech, a lot of beech, some white pine, sugar maple. It's been evolving in this, you know, disturbance regime. If you go in the, the old growth forest that we do have in Vermont, which, which isn't much, there's about 35 acres of sort of undisturbed old growth, growth forest in Vermont in seven different locations. So they're very isolated little chunks. And they're a mess. You would, you know, it's not what you would think of of the primeval forest and people talk about, you know, cathedral-like canopy. It's a jumbled mess. You know, they're big trees, get old and blown over and knock over other trees and 
bunch of little trees growing in and amongst it, very sort of chaotic uh, forest. And that's somewhat what this is trying to represent. Before, actually, even before Samuel de Champlain sailed down uh, Lake Champlain and said, ah, Vermont, uh, something was happening that was really important and affected our forests uh, in, in uh, New England. And that was there was a craze in Europe over beaver hats. And coincidentally, around about the same time, the late 1500s, early 1600s, beavers were extinct in Europe. I mean, they hunted every last beaver. And it's, it's uh, been over the last 20 years, actually, they've been reintroducing beaver in places in Europe. The beavers in Europe, where they did remain, uh, actually forgot how to make dams. They couldn't, they didn't make dams, beavers, the beavers in Europe didn't make dams anymore. <laughs> that, they were that depleted from the landscape and their ability to live in their natural surroundings were that far gone. But um, while Samuel Champlain was here, the trappers uh, were already here and the people were trading with the uh, natives for beaver pelts and it was uh, much more active than anybody really even realizes before there was any settlement going on. These little guys had an incredible impact on the landscape. Um, this Batten Kill Valley would have been you know, beaver flowage after beaver flowage after beaver flowage. It's incredible wetland complexes and uh, valley bottom forests that develop around these. Um, and over the next 200 years or so, um, we put a pretty good dent in the beaver population and certainly changed the, the valleys as they became uh, highly desirable for agricultural use and that type of thing. And this, people are slowly learning that these are important and um, they're slowly coming back and we obviously see a lot of uh, beavers now around here and people tend not to get along with beavers because they plug culverts and flood roads and don't seem to cooperate very well with the uh, highway department. <laughs> so moving forward a little bit more, say the early 1700s, and the first settlers started to push up into Vermont, and uh, there were different ways that they came to be on land. There was sort of a homesteading. There were efforts by, the, by basically the government to get people on the land, to get people clearing the land. Um, and there was a huge amount of clearing that took place. Um, basically, in, in 100 years, uh, almost 75% of the forest was completely cleared. Now, this was not logging. This was not for the use of these trees, which must have been you know, incredible in some places. This was slash and burn clearing. People trying to get uh, their little, these were little subsistence farms, cleared out, uh, eked out. You can see the farmer has begun to build stone walls uh, around some of his property. Uh, in some cases, just as a place to put the stones that he pulled out of the soil, in other ways to demarcate property, other uh, ways used to fence animals. Um, but slowly, the land was cleared. Uh, and again, if you just, if you can just imagine, you go into even, you know, go up the side of the equinox and think about walking into that place and saying, you know, having a vision for an agricultural field and all you had is a team of oxen and an ax, uh, and maybe one of these. Uh, not completely irrelevant, but I, I just like equipment and technology. These are, here's a pair of oxen on this device, and I don't know if you can see that huge rock, but this was a device they used to pull stumps. Uh, and I just, I love this picture. They're all lined up here, and one's already hooked up. Uh, but think about pulling, I mean, pulling stumps without, I mean, even with an excavator, it yeah. seems like a challenge, but uh, that's a pretty cool device. So a lot of it early on was all oxen and um, horses came a little later. And you go out in the forest today and you see the signs of that work. This, a lot of these stone walls 
came very, very early in the, in the settlement and clearing of this land. And they remain today. And often you can see very different forest types on one side of the wall. Say this side was kept in agriculture for much longer, and this side was abandoned uh, more recently. And you'll see a very different structure on one side or the other. You'll also sometimes see a stone wall at the base of a hill, and the land will be four or five feet higher on the uphill side than on the downhill side. And that's a result of both plowing and, and soil erosion uh, that created that. But uh, I recently heard they've estimated there's 250,000 miles of stone walls in New England and New York. And it took a, a couple of men and oxen I think uh, one day to build, they thought, 10 to 15 feet. I, I don't know how else to explain the incredible labor that went into clearing this land. Um, this, so this is uh, actually the outline of Merck Forest, 3,100 acres. Uh, Charlie Cogbill went back and he traced the titles of ownership for this land back to uh, when it was first settled. This is 1790. And those are property boundaries, or leaseholdings, or whatever. But those are individual, individually operated subsistence farms. You know, we talk about fragmentation and parcelization today, but in a way, in the late 1700s, this land was way more parcelized than it is today. Um, and of course, you find the cellar holes and the apple trees and. This is in the Dover Town Forest. This is like three miles uh, up in the woods. You know, you can, uh, it's very hard to get there now. And these people had eked it out, cleared it, and were subsiding on the landscape. So then, there were, there were some changes. Uh, people started to, to, you know, it was just hard living. So a lot of those settlers just didn't make it and started to leave. And the farm started to get more consolidated. Um, and there was another <laughs> fashion craze. Uh, and it brought the Merino sheep to Vermont. And uh, might be a little exaggerated to say sort of industrialization, but agriculture changed from this small little individual subsistence farm into bigger, uh, bigger farming complexes that used more of the land. And this went on to about uh, 1850. And 1850 was the peak of uh, land clearing in Vermont. Again, about 75% of the forests had been totally cleared uh, from the state for agriculture. Right now, we're about flip-flopped. Uh, it's about 25% uh, open and 75% forested. Uh, and two years ago, was the first time since 1850, uh, I'm sorry, since the, uh, it was maybe 1940 where things had gotten forested again, where we started to see a decline in, in forest acres. Um, and this has brought some concern you've heard about maybe in the legislature and stuff on forest fragmentation. But heavy clearing, um, forest gone, still seed trees around, still little uh, woodlots, they're still, like up on the side of Equinox, you can still find these remnant, they're like five acre parcels. And you had your farm down in the valley and then you had your woodlot up on the side of the mountain where there were trees and you got your firewood and, and things like that. Uh, these walls from the original settlers still remain, sometimes were used. Uh, this is that same picture of Merck in 1880 and you can see this consolidation happening. Uh, people have moved out and parcels have become larger. So the Civil War, the discovery of the Midwest and flat land with topsoil that was six feet deep and didn't have a rock in it. And, uh, Railroads that could transport now, transport food from long distance, the, the canals at first to some degree, and people started leaving Vermont in droves. Um, and so, took me long enough to get here, didn't it? But this 
is where the forests that we have around us today really started to develop. Um, and you can see, so here was this pine seed tree. You can see little white pine creeping into the pasture. And as slowly the more marginal land was abandoned and came back to pasture and just more and more focus on the valley and use of the land in the valley, um, the forest started to cre creep in. Same, similar process in terms of succession, except now we have, we we have topsoil, we have seeds close by. So this is called secondary succession, where you already have some of the things in place that can take foothold. This uh, <laughs> white pine, uh, characteristically around here in the Battenkill Valley, we don't really have white pine forests. White pine likes to grow on sandy soils uh, where it can compete better than, than the hardwoods. But there was a phenomenon that happened as the land was abandoned for agriculture and say you had animals, sheep or cows, in this little area, they would eat the hardwoods, but they wouldn't touch the white pine. And then, so the white pine gets a little bit of a foothold, and uh, then you remove the animals, and the white pine jumps in, takes advantage of that uh, growing space, but you couldn't grow white pine underneath that to save your life. We, we tried on a an experimental forest that the University of Vermont had. And we burned it and we went in with bulldozers and scarified the understory and we seeded it and we get nothing back but sugar, sugar maple. Because uh, these are very good sites. These are, we have, we have good amount of rainfall, we have good moisture. The hardwoods can way, way outcompete the white pine. Um, actually, a lot of Hildeen's forests represent this. And in a picture a little ways down the way, I'll, I'll show this. We have, there's a lot of pine forests here. And what we're doing is regenerating hardwoods. We, we try to keep some of the beautiful big pines like legacies, because they're beautiful trees. But uh, then, so after the agricultural uh, boom in New England, then we had cities to build. Uh, and this is really when the logging history starts. So 1900, something like that. This is the Connecticut River. Uh, 1870 through 1915, uh, a quarter of a million spruce logs were driven down the Connecticut River, 300 miles down the C Connecticut River. Uh, took five months. And this, this is basically what built Boston, New York City, um, you know, the big cities on the... And it was happening right here in Manchester, Vermont. Uh, the rich lumber company uh, had some new technology. Get in trouble with Mr. Weibel here, but Shays, a Shays locomotive that enabled them to get up into the plateau, which was heretofore inaccessible, certainly for lumber extraction. Um, they were able to build this railroad, uh, and they thought they had enough, uh, enough spruce logs up in that area, which is now the Lybrook Wilderness, to uh, operate a sawmill in Manchester for 15 years. And I mean, talk about an engineering feat. Uh, and if anybody has ever walked up to Lybrick Falls, you're walking up the, at least for the first part, the railroad bed. But um, it's, it's uh, pretty impressive technology. Um, and it was uh, a huge operation. At first when I saw this, I was thinking, this, uh, this could be taken from Hildeen, but I think it was maybe more like the Wilburton Inn or something. It's not a great picture, but this is the rich, uh, lumber mill uh, was on Richville Road, <coughs> um, and quite a quite a huge facility. 16 million board feet of spruce lumber a year, uh, which, I mean, even for modern sawmills, it was two it was two band mills. Um, that it was a pretty impressive operation. Um, this is another sawmill up in uh, towards like Kelly Stan, East Arlington. Um, 
So this was going, was going on in the Adirondacks, uh, you know, places that were before inaccessible because they had just horses or oxen. Now with railroads, they could get to. And this, this is really the period where uh, lumber production kicked in. This is the logging crew and Kelly stand. Uh, it's hard for me to see up close, but there's quite a few horses, but they're still using uh, oxen for logging. So, uh, so, sort of the sad story on the Rich Lumber Company, but somebody hadn't done their math right, or whoever cruised the woodlands hadn't counted the trees right or something, and uh, five years into it, they started running out of wood. And, and one thing was that originally they thought it was 12,000 acres and it turned out to be 7,000 acres. Um, but the First World War happened. Uh, they had a couple fires at the, the mill and that was the end of the Rich Lumber Company. So we're getting closer, right? 1942, gonna make it. Um, this is uh, aerial, the, the first aerial photography uh, was flown in New England in 1942 doesn't take too much imagination to wonder why. Um, and uh, the Green Mountain National Forest was established in 1932. Uh, so after a lot of this heavy logging in places like the Adirondacks in New Hampshire and Vermont, there were these huge fires because they would, they would cut the trees, they'd leave all the slash. They had uh, either coal or wood-fired railroads, so there was a lot of sparks, and so there were huge, devastating fires in the Adirondacks, uh, some in the Green Mountains, and some in New Hampshire. And this pushed, uh, was a big push for protecting public land. And the Adirondack Park and the Green Mountain National Forest and some of these other public lands came out of a need to like, we need to protect some land. So you're looking at uh, the red line is the boundary line of uh, Hildeen's ownership. This is uh, 1942. Here's uh, historic 7A. Um, up here, and you can start to see in some places, so this is River Road here. This is all open uh, predominantly, except for little dots of green, which are white pine. And what's, what's happening here was very similar to what I showed in that diorama picture. The, the white pine's getting a foothold uh, here in 1942. Um, and these, some of these forests, uh, like there's one here that's very young and uh, over here that's still actually open pasture. I mean, we did a thinning harvest in here, uh, geez, five years ago, something like that. So again, this, you can start to see the forest coming back in. This is 2010. It's not as dramatic within the boundary of Hildeen itself, although you can see now this is forested, whereas before this was all open. But uh, look up here, you know, all these, see the white pine creeping in here? This, these darker green dots, those are all mature white pine trees. Um, so the forest we have now is, uh, you know, 120 to 150 years old. It's all um, largely what we call even age, meaning it all came in in that successionary pathway. All the trees started growing at the same time. So instead of where that, the natural forest uh, that the Europeans first found here, that was all a big jumble of different age classes and sizes and such, um, this, this forest is all the same age, which, which has made it, makes it a little more, um, threatened by these wind disturbances and, and, and things like that. That's why we, we, we're kind of feeling that a little bit. And, and again, in forestry, what we're trying to do is get some different age classes growing and get some diver, diversification. Um, so I have to end with my man, Aldo Leopold. Um, the last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. If the biota in the course of eons has built something that we like but do not understand, 
then who, would, who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts? To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. <laughs> um, through this story, at least the last 350 year part of it, um, we've lost the American chestnut, which was a very prominent tree species in this area. There's certainly efforts uh, going on to restore it. Uh, American elm, uh, butternut, butternut is not looking that great. Um, hemlock is now uh, under the specter of a, an insect. Uh, emerald ash borer is on our doorstep. Um, so we're starting to tinker with some of the cogs here. Uh, wolves, catamounts. Um, I forgot to mention during that whole agricultural clearing phase, deer were actually extirpated from Vermont. Deer and turkeys. There were no deer and turkeys. They were, they were all reintroduced. Um, so I'm not sure we've done a great job of intelligent tinkering, but um, places like Hildeen that, that carry the torch of sustainability and, and have people look at, at what's important, like the pollinators, which, you know, when we started our first management plan, you know, talking about pollinators was not even on the radar screen. Um, you know, now the three bumblebees have been listed on the state endangered species list, and they're, as far as anybody can tell, they are, they're gone. They, they can't uh, find them. So uh, it's an important thing to focus on. So I'll stop there and uh, take any questions, and thank you for listening.